everybody, welcome to Gear Fest. This is pretty awesome. Um, for me, for a number of reasons. Uh, in addition to being your moderator, I get to hang out with some uh, guitar players that I've been looking up to for a long time, and they're on the stage here with me today, which is pretty amazing. Um, you're really in for a treat. It's going to be 45 to 50 minutes of some spirited guitar tone conversation. This is the Getting Great Electric Guitar Tone Workshop, if you don't know where you're at. Okay, Everybody, everybody's got that, right? Probably some familiar faces on this stage, which I'll introduce momentarily. But just to prove that I'm actually not um, some guy they pulled off the street, I am a Nashville-based session and touring musician. I'm a songwriter, producer, instructor, and an occasional gear demo guy that you may have seen every once in a while. I, I come to Sweetwater quite often and take advantage of the cafe and racquetball court and you know putt-putt golf, all that kind of stuff, and then play a little guitar uh, <laughs> at the same time. Um, but we're here to talk guitar tone. We're here to talk about how we get our favorite tones. Uh, we're gonna talk about our favorite amps. If we were on a desert island, what would we have with us? And uh, it's, it's fair to say that there's some folks on this stage that you can trust their opinions, and uh, we're gonna be able to ask them some questions too. So um, I have this little script here that I was following, and it says, Corey gets to fanboy for a minute. And I've already started to do that for the, the past two minutes now, but these are, these are guys that, um, have influenced me in a, in a lot of ways, uh, guitar tone specifically, but musical approach and and uh, and ultimately their professionalism and their their gracious amount of uh, humility that they exude. Um, somebody said on Facebook to me, uh, "Man, it'd be great to be one of those guys." And I said, "Those guys are one of us. They're they're some of the most humble guys I've ever been around." And it's a uh, it's a pretty big moment for me to be sitting on the stage here with them. Um, to my right. I want to talk about a guy who, um, before I talk about him, you know, you probably have seen some movies called uh, Super Bad, the 40-year-old version for getting Sarah Marshall, get him to the Greeks. Any of those ring a bell? Yeah? Um, this guy has something to do with, uh, with all the music that you heard in, the, in, the, in those films. And not only uh, is he a world-renowned composer, masterful player of many instruments, he's just a straight-up killer guitar player and uh, made me want to stop as soon as he started warming up. Um, as a session musician, he's worked with uh, Ziggy Marley, Michael Bublé, Sarah McLachlan, Nora Jones, uh, Brian Adams, I don't know if you've heard of any of those people, and Jellyfish, which is some of my favorite work. Yeah, yeah. He was a member of Todd Rudnard's group and done a string of tours and records with him, and uh, he's worked with the Pixies founder, uh, Frank Black, as well. So uh, it's a pretty long resume. Uh, some of his recent work can be heard on the Netflix show Love, which I'm in the third season of watching. I really dig that. And HBO's Crashing. And he still finds the time to make his own records. Uh, Purple Passages, Tabula Rasa, and Harmonic Crusader. You want to treat your ears to those. It was, it's really listenable instrumental music. They're songs, folks. They're really, really fantastic. Um, so do yourself a favor. Get out there and listen to some music created by the one and only Mr. Lyle Workman. can figure out how to use this app. Oh, here we go. Yeah. So the players I've always looked up to and, and were inspired by were session musicians. And we've had a lot of conversations here in the past 24 hours about this kind of stuff, about how it's about not only playing for the song, but getting the right tone for the song. My favorite session musicians always said, figure out how to get the sound first and the producer will be happy. And I don't think there's anyone that can do that in a myriad of ways, like the guy next to Lyle Workman. Um, you know, it's one of the biggest reasons I play guitars is because I love different styles, I love different instruments and different amps, and session players like this guy can make music on all of them, like, you know, you've all heard, trust me. Um, he's played on records since the late 70s from artists as diverse as Michael Jackson, Madonna, Shinedown, Ozzy, um, and if you have an afternoon, pack a lunch and go on allmusic.com and, uh, and search this guy's discography because you're going to be there for a while. It's really a privilege to have not only LA session musician, but now a YouTube channel star. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Tim Pierce. Thank you. Thank you. So next to Tim is a guy that I connect with uh, in, in a really special way. In the mid 2000s, um, I was teaching guitar in a four by eight closet in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And uh, I had this student that brought in these, 
these things called CDs. And uh, it was uh, Lucinda Williams and Emmylou Harris and Sean Colvin. And as much as I loved their artistry and their songwriting and their singing, I was really connected to the guitar playing because it encompassed blues, rock, country, gospel, R&B, rockabilly, um, great acoustic, great singing. Um, it just sounded like all these styles were wrapped up into one, and it also sounded like the guitar was just plugged right into the amp, probably because it was. <laughs> um, so he's also worked as a sideman to Emmylou Harris, Robert Plant, many more, worked on uh, records with Richard Thompson, Solomon Burke, Patty Griffin, Ralph Stanley, and more. He makes wonderful records with his wife, Julie. Uh, Keep Your Distance was a song that as soon as I heard that, I said, I want to sing harmony with a woman like that sometime and, and play guitar. Um, incredibly sweet human being that can play the H-E double hockey sticks out of the guitar. He's brought his baritone for us all today. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Buddy Miller. Yeah. I'll find some of my other notes because I'm gonna go probably even longer about this guy. Um, so I spent so much time in uh, Western Pennsylvania and, and when you're in a smaller town, you. Uh, you gravitate towards the best guys in that town, best girls, whoever is playing the best music and producing the best music. And um, I was in a music store and I was following around this producer who became a, a dear friend and a mentor of mine. And he had this, um, this Weezer CD and, and I was like, he didn't seem like he was the kind of guy that would listen to Weezer. And uh, he said, well, it's this, this guy produced it named, uh, well, so I'll say his name in a minute. And so I started checking this guy out and uh, I was just immediately taken by how specific and purposeful his guitar playing was and how purposeful the guitar tones were. Um, and I was like, wow, this is guitar playing. He can shred, but he's picking his, picking his spots when to shred, which I thought was a really mature thing. Um, you know, he's been recording his own music since the 80s. In addition to doing his own music, you, you, you've heard his work with Pink, Katy Perry, Keith Urban, Fall Out Boy, Panic at the Disco, many, many more. Um, his lyrics, I mean, they're captivating, they're humorous. Uh, he tells a wonderful story. Um, I'm, I'm off the script because uh, he's another guy that means the world to me as far as my development as a musician, and I'm just gonna get right to it. Ladies and gentlemen, from Cartersville, Georgia, Mr. Butch Walker. Okay, are you done now? <laughs> so, so we're here to talk about guitar tone, and uh, we're, it, it, we've reached a point in the show where I got four sets of eyes on me saying, okay, now what do we do? So, but I want to talk to folks like Buddy and say, you know, it's, what we hear nowadays is that guy's got great tone. And that can be kind of ambiguous to a person that really may be just beginning and don't, doesn't really know how to get a great tone, but, but what to you encompasses a great guitar tone? when you hear it. What? Well, I don't know. I, I, I went to a lot of concerts when I was a kid. I record a lot of them from the audiences, you know, a little teenager with a reel to reel, and come back home and listen to shows from the film and go, this sounds amazing. And then even then, I try to record. Um, and I, I, I could never get a sound that I like. And after a little while, I realized, well, you don't listen to an amp with your ear up against it, necessarily. Um, there's the room, there's the air in the room, there's where it is, and there's distance from what's going on there. So I, I was, I had some frustrations with with tone for a while, um, and it took a, it, it, I'm still, you know, I think we're all still, look, well, you guys aren't looking, I'm always still looking, I pick up a guitar and go, you know, until fairly recently, uh, when I've come to terms with it. But yeah, finding that sound, I mean, I don't think having a mic up against the speaker is the way we listen to music. Um, I mean, there's cats like songwriters in uh, Robert Muscle Shoals way back when, Dan Pan, who said, man, it's the air. It's the air just around there even. It's everything affects it. You can get like a, a good deal of the way, but I think a room, for me, adding a room sound to a, to a guitar, just having more mics in the room and maybe not using them, but just giving it a vibe. Well, I always admired, I always admired the tone I heard on records that you were on, because it just sounded so organic, and, it, and that makes a lot of sense to me now, because it sounds like it was inspired by those records you're talking about and those, those sounds. So that being said, I think everybody would love to hear your tone 
with your baritone, if you wouldn't mind just playing a few notes for the folks. Wait a minute, I didn't know that was part oh. of Oh! Well, this thing, I, I play... Well, disregard the notes that are not in tune. <laughs> and uh, it's tuned from A to A. I, I play with a lot of, of women, and um, and sometimes I play just with them, or just me in a, in a small configuration. I found that they sing in terrible keys. Um, <laughs> you know, there's a, a, a lot of keys like B flat or E flat yeah. or things that I don't know how to play. And so I can take this out and uh, and play it, and it covers the low end and the high end a lot. And uh, I mean, the one thing I wish somebody here. If somebody, if this is possible, the one thing I've wanted all my life is moving dots on the side of the guitar. Can somebody please come up with that? We just kind of turn a little scroll like you would on a harmonium. You got the harmoniums that have changed keys. Just kind of move the dots, because man, I can't do the math up there if somebody has a guitar I'm playing in E flat. But anyway, sorry, don't need to take that time. Oh, go for it. Moving do movable dots. I mean, it looks half the time they look like they're moving anyway. There's a lot of things manufacturing. So it's got a lower thing to That's the bear. Yeah, man. How about that? You can get away. I've gotten away with so much. You know, being, I'm, I'm by far the worst player up here. Oh, and I feel like I've gotten away with murder, but finding instruments like this that have their own voice to them. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great because I think that all goes with the tone. Is is as you build your tone, you're also putting the pieces with it, whether it be a different instrument or, or your pedal chain or any of that kind of stuff. So, yeah, that's certainly helpful. So, Lyle, are you a guy that is a massive tweaker? Are you a set it and forget it? You, you've been tweaking for a little up here, so can you talk about sort of how you step up to an amp and you say, okay, you know, I think I understand what this amp's gonna do. Let me jump in and start doing it and uh, start dialing stuff in. And and how, like, what's your approach immediately? Are you trying to get the voice of the guitar, trying to get the characteristic of the amp? Um, the first thing is what what is the assignment? Right. You know, like what what is, is a lot of what I do is just a variety of different kinds of music. So it's it's trying to go to the most uh, 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 real sound, that whatever it's supposed to be. You know, it's supposed to be a rock sound or it's supposed to be a jazz sound. So it's, it starts with the guitar and then, you know, whatever amp I think makes that sound. Um, and then, yeah, no, it's not a set it and forget it by any, by any means because you might have a sound for one thing and it's just, just completely wrong. For, for the other thing, so it's 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 changing guitars, changing amps, moving the mics around, or in the case of this box here, which we'll talk about, just don't move it. It does it for you, you know, right. so to speak. So very much. Yeah, and I know, well, I think what's important for the folks to know is that we're aside from some of us using our own instruments, and, and some of us have our amps up here. You're a great example because as a as somebody who's making all kinds of music all the time, you're a chameleon like like Tim or like all of us would, would be at any particular time. But but you and Tim probably more so than anyone. So you have to adapt to the tool in your hand for the for the track. Right. And and he was he was kind of warming up and just playing the heck out of this thing and getting all kinds of great sounds out of a rig he's never played before. And and so imagine that folks, you fly all the way from California and you come up on the stage to do this. And uh, you know, I'm I'm hiding my, my nervous energy right now. But if like if I didn't have my gear, I probably would be even more nervous. That's how I feel. <laughs> so so to put you on the spot, let's just let's just hear some some Lyle Workman, uh, you know, Work. mojo out of this it rig you've never played. Yeah, I, I didn't know where we were like the place. I didn't I didn't know where we were on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. When I listen to Lyle's music, 
I say to myself, they can't possibly be guitar chords. Like, what in the world are some of those inversions? So I said, um, next trip to LA, stop in at Lyle's for a lesson, stop in at Tim's for a lesson. <laughs> and I'm gonna make Butch produce a song with me. So, you know, they don't know, it's all part of the deal. You know? So, um, no, that, that's fantastic. And I, I, I think, um, folks, you have to get an understanding that, that um, if you're into carpentry or you're into you know any kind of mechanical work, you reach into the toolbox and you pick the a specific tool for the job and it might not be right. And when you've been doing work like these guys have been doing for such a long time, your, your ear just keeps getting refined and refined to say, okay, I think that's the tool I'm gonna use with this particular amplifier. And it, it, it really gets them to the finish line, I think. Yeah, yeah, awesome. So Tim. You're on a desert island, and somebody has you do, they say, I want you to record guitar for 12 tracks. What amp are you taking? It really kind of doesn't matter at this point, because um, the sound really is in your hands. Yeah. But you do need something. What I try and do with an amplifier is find the sweet spot where it's about, I've said this before, any of you guys, uh, I, so I apologize. I've said it many times. You have to turn an amp up to where it's beginning to compress, and it's still pretty clean, but you hear gain in there so that it's not plinky, because you don't want to be too distorted. Like, I'll push an amp with a micro amp or some sort of very organic sounding, natural sounding overdrive. Bring an amp to its sweet spot on a Fender, it might be five or six. The divided by 13 I use a lot, it's <laughs> at about two. It distorts very quickly. So that it starts to compress naturally, and then you can kind of do everything from there with the volume on the guitar, with a pedal or whatever. Um, so you can literally use one amp for your whole career if you want to, as long as you just pay attention to the five or six decades of music that we all know. <laughs> and you pull sounds and parts, it might be tremolo, it might be surf, it might be heavy metal. You can get it from that pedal board and any of the amps up here. It's not that hard anymore. Um, to get guitar sounds. Right. Yeah, I often say we're in the golden age of guitar Absolutely. sound because Absolutely. there's so much great gear that's available uh, and that's uh, relatively inexpensive for what you get for the yeah. price, which is yeah. really great. The tech, as, the, as the, the folks who invent this stuff, as their brains enlarge, it helps it to get to our hands. At a, at yeah, a and you, you actually have to give up your preconceptions. And unfortunately, if you buy a very amazing app and bring it home, you might decide that it doesn't sound very good, and you have, so you have to give up preconceptions sometimes, because the sound might be somewhere else, and it might mean that you have to sell the amp that you just bought. I mean, th that, that happens. That happened to me when I was 14. I bought a JCM 800, and I couldn't crank it up in my bedroom, but I saw everybody else that had a JCM yeah. 800, and I was like, why doesn't this sound yeah. like I think yeah. it should sound? Yeah. So you're right, I mean, you might, mean you, you might have to get a five block amp as opposed to a hundred block. Yeah, and you got something that would uh, take the volume down. It, it, it's it's funny, I wonder if we have anything like that on the stage. <laughs> we're probably all looking at these funny boxes that we're going to talk about here shortly. Yeah, so no, but ahead. Tim, you're, you're doing a, uh, a PRS event here as well. I am. And you have, you have to have one of those fantastic Yeah, guitars. because like every, I didn't bring anything, because it doesn't matter. And, and we didn't have any time to prepare, and this is just... That's fine with me. I don't... Yeah, it doesn't sound bad. It's not terrible, right? And then I have a pedal. Gas that thing. Right now, we can go. Yeah, yeah. It's like go. You know. We actually are. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, think, I, I, think, I think that helps a lot of people out here because you know we're in this social media world, and, and if you read the comments, it's uh, Tim will post something, and someone will go, "What pickups are in that guitar? What string gauge do you use? What pick gauge do you use? What pedal? What's your, what's your cables? What's the uh, are those the orange drop capacitors in that?" And you have one of the most accomplished session musicians on a stage here saying it doesn't matter. That's what I like. Right? How about that? Yeah. So we were having a pretty we were having a pretty spirited conversation last night about guitars with pointy headstocks and uh, you know in particular eras of, of music that we were all involved in. And uh, 
Butch and I have had conversations about maybe what his next record's gonna be like and some of the guitar sounds he's going for. So I think we all would love to know, particularly from Butch, because you're just, you're the rock dude that screams, makes these amps just, I mean, I, I've gone after your tone, whether you know it or not. <laughs> and I wanna know, for the, on behalf of, or the, for the folks here, tell me about a tone that blew your mind, like some of the tones that you've created have blown mine. So, some of your favorite guitar tones of all time, or one that really made you say, I need to, I need to get that. Well, um, I think when, when, I was, when I was young and I was starting to get into listening to, to rock and roll, um, I might have been more infatuated with, the, with the, the entire package more than guitar. You know, I started a drummer, and um, <clears throat> until I heard this guy, Eddie Van Halen, and yeah. <laughs> when, I, when, I heard, when I heard You Really Got Me, the cover of The Kinks, I was like, Part of my language, what the fuck is that? <laughs> you know, it's like this sounds like a like a space alien is playing this. Yeah. You know, like I mean, and, and it was an eruption, the solo that like just kind of reinvented rock guitar. I thought, um, and I think people have been chasing that record ever since. And that's that came out in the seventies. Yeah, I mean, when you create a, like a catchphrase, a, like brown sound, yeah, you 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 certainly done something to change music and guitar as we know it, right. for sure, yeah. So, you know, for this next record, you had a, God, I don't want to blow anything for you, <laughs> any secrets to your crowd, but you were talking about some of your favorite, you know, some of your favorite players like Landau, Lukather, and, and people that, that have great tone. What, what about their tone influenced you to say, oh man, I'd like to maybe research that a little bit more for my next record? Well, that was back when, you, you know, uh, when a lot of the session work was being done by these guys that were shredders in their own bands, and uh, I think uh, it was cool that they were experimenting with, 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 with racks and and not afraid to use chorus pedals yeah. and get like these big washy sounds, but sounded really dope in context on the records that they were doing. You know, I mean, it's all obviously it's all it's all subjective. I mean, a lot of people might it might not be everyone's thing, but I just enjoyed, um, also, I mean, you know, I just thought Luke there was yeah. the most tasteful guy within a four bar solo you could you could hear on the on the radio at the time. You're like, who, who is this? What is this solo in this song by the tubes? You know, and it's right. like, well, that's all of Toto, basically. Not not just Africa, but like, you know, <laughs> they they were they were all just badass musicians and he was like, you know, he was he was killing it on records. And I loved the tasteful melodic memorable solos that same reason I think people like Beatles records because the melodies are, are so memorable right. and, and, and we gravitate towards that. You know, like you doing uh, Jellyfish records, which I'm good friends with Roger Manning and he plays on a lot of my records with me. We, we, we have these we have these talks all the time about, you know, it doesn't matter what walk of life you came from, everybody just really appreciates a, a good melody, I think. Yeah, I mean, we could, and, and I would be the person leading the, the, uh, the ship here would talk about music talk as opposed to guitar tone. Of course, they all go together. But you have folks up here on the panel that would all probably agree that, you know, we love to sit around and create a good guitar tone and, and sit in our room or our studio or whatever and just kind of go nuts. But we're talking about four bars of music often that we have to be creative in and not only play something melodic, but have it be a really, really good tone as well. So that's often the challenges that, that we're presented with. And, and I do a handful of stuff in, in Nashville where it's like, oh man, I'm, you know, somebody's like, okay, it's time for the solo. And I'm like, okay, let me write it real quick. Cause that's going to be more memorable and I'll adjust the tone at the same time. So Tim. Well, yeah. And you, you, you've got four people, five people over here <laughs> who we only exist in the context of songs. It's not about the guitar. Everything all of us do is in the context of a greater purpose, and that's music. A lot of guitar players just want to show how special they are and how amazing they are. If you want to make a living and support a family, you, but it wasn't that for me. I think all of us, I fell in love with Top 40 Radio in the 60s. And it, it, I literally was walking two feet above the ground when I would hear these songs on the radio. And that's what brought me to music. It's not the guitar. The guitar fits in there, and it's part of that. But I don't exist. It's like I, I liken myself to a surgeon. If there's not a patient on the table, I don't operate on nothing. You know, it's 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 the song. Yeah. 
It's really deep. <laughs> I, I'm very competitive. Very competitive. <laughs> Buddy, I got a, he was a hard act to follow. <laughs> I love, though, that you used the word plinky. That was a word that was, I've been thinking, when I knew uh, they were coming up here. That is the word that's like stuck in my, that's the word my wife will use. I've heard for like 35 years from her. That's uh, describing the bad tone. I think uh -huh. she has much better ears. The plinky thing is what I've been working to avoid. I love hearing plinky. Is that, a, that is a word, right? Well, there are no I there are no clean guitar sounds. I'm disguising dirt in every right. clean sound. Right. Yes, so that, that's part of it. and that's a that's a great segue. That believe it or not, I didn't set up. They just did this on their own. So the, so the thing is, is a lot of in the in the teaching world that I do it and Tim does it as well. We often get questions that are these blanket statements like, well, "What shouldn't I do?" or "What should I do?" Uh, to get this thing or to play this way. And it's often really hard to answer those questions because it's so much experience and trial and error that goes along with learning what to play at the right time and the right tone and all that sort of thing. I mean, I, I certainly made a lot of bad decisions creating guitar tones, um, which means I should have listened to these guys more. But what would you say is something that you should absolutely shy away from whether you're, you're doing something live or going for a great tone or you're in the studio i mean um, is there any i mean i know there's no rules in, in art particularly with guitar art but is there anything that you can impart to some folks that would say i would probably not consider this nobody's saying anything. it's a bad question Help us, being look. louder than the singer all right <laughs> see that's what i'm saying <laughs> yeah that's actually really good Thank you. Yeah. Well, a lot of times when I try and do a, a, a guitar solo, I'm going to leave space. So I'm looking at the waveform of Pro Tools, and I, I play a phrase, and there's a space, and I play another phrase, and there's a space, and then for the next two minutes, it's a solid line, and I go, I couldn't even leave space. So leave space. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't play constantly. The, the best advice I got, I was on the Robert Plant and Allison Krauss tour in the guitar player seat, and also playing. Yeah. And, uh, sorry, no, I wasn't bragging, I was, I, I was, it was humiliating at the time, I was also playing auto harp, and I volunteered to play pedal steel. And, and I, put it, I put off the rehearsing of the pedal steel because I was so bad. I played when I was in high school, when I was a kid, but I hadn't played since then. I said, uh, my friend Greg Lee's played the steel parts on the record. I thought, you know, he's so tasteful and simple, I can do this. Well. Two days before the first gig, we hadn't run any of the song. I put it off, and I was there, nervous, um, both hands shaking, both feet shaking, with like Robert Plant, Allison Krauss, who has perfect pitch, um, and knows it, and uh, and Kevin <laughs> Burnett looking at me, sitting behind this instrument. And the best piece of advice I got from a steel player friend of mine is, don't play when they're singing, and that stuck with me for everything. It stuck with me for a, a lot of the songs. Let the songs speak. And, uh, and and weave and feather our way around it. Yeah. But it it's doesn't really have to be there. It's really about listening. Yeah. You know, listening to everything, the big picture, like you said, Tim, it's, it's how does what you do fit in to the overall vision, and not what you can do to fill up space. Right. If the play means playing nothing, then you play nothing. And that can look really cool, too. Yeah. Playing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it crosses all all genres because even in like hard rock I mean Eddie and Randy Rhodes played their asses off but they still played around the vocal so, right yeah. you know they squeezed every note they could in right in, in the vocal. but I mean it was it was awesome yeah you know and they left room for the vocal to be featured so and I realized I forgot to put Bush on the spot oh. which is playing this killer Yamaha that he's tricked out through a, a, a 65 Princeton reverb uh, reissue and he's got a pedal that's kind of got his name attached to it, so. Um, yeah, and uh, I wrote this this morning. I'm not ready for that, I'll wait for you. We are in a music store. I wrote this yesterday. <laughs> Plinky talk, I'm like, I'm a plinker. <laughs> <laughs> so 
so I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't put myself on the spot. Um, I'm, I'm up here playing um, this kind of modified, cool '64 SG that was once uh, a junior that was owned by a bunch of different people in Nashville. Some of them are, I think, probably here. Um, <laughs> I have this really great two rock traditional clean behind me, uh, which is kind of like a big beefed up Fender. Um, really sounds killer. I'm a pedal guy because I have to be because I never really move my chair real quick. Because I never know what I'm going to get thrown at me. And uh, Lyle was like, oh, that's your pedal board? And I was like, well, that's the travel pedal board. <laughs> the other pedal board is two, three times the size. That's the 20 inch. I think I have a 32 inch one. And it's, um, uh, size doesn't always matter with what pedal are you boards. To say? Yeah, I was going to say size doesn't always matter. But, uh, but I can get a really just kind of great, you know, bass clean tone with a really killer reverb. clean platform amp like this, it takes pedals. So I can get a lot of, I kind of go for a little bit of a small thing. A little bit of a small thing. Uh, the artist I'm playing with right now wants more reverb than I can give her sometimes. But it's awesome because we're playing like that. That kind of stuff. So, uh, we're able to get these great tones um, at home, actually. And these guys that are up here talking with me, we've been doing it with, um, with a lot of success. And we're doing it with tube amplifiers. And we're doing it kind of at any volume and in any environment. I know Buddy and I have had conversations about, uh, he's got a, a great studio in his house, but he's been using uh, his deluxe in his little writing room while he's getting ideas down. And, uh, and he's using this product that you see on top of our amplifiers here. Um, there's, there's no easy way to get into this discussion that we're all becoming fans of using our gear in the studio to get the tones that we want. Um, we might be using, uh, Butch and I have been talking about a, a two rock that he has that he's pulled out that he's been using and he's been able to, to use it and to kind of get the most out of it by using this, this box right here on, on top of our amps. This is Ox, the amp top box from Universal Audio. So everybody's tone is pretty great up here, right? It's all sounded great, yeah. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about why it sounds great, but um, if, if all of you could tell a little bit about the challenges that you've had recording at home or at different levels, and maybe if, if uh, you could talk about the success you're having using a product like Ox. Can I? Fire away, but Because I am really excited about it. It's changed things for me. It's like another instrument. Um, like I have a, a, I do record in my home. The downstairs is all just that's where we work. We have a, nine foot trident B range and a bunch of, a ton of gear. And, but upstairs has a vibe to it that we like. My, my wife and I write, she's got a lot of songs recorded and she's very good. So I'm up there, I can't open up an amp, it's the sweet spot that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And this has changed, I, I played through the Swart amps, Michael Swart makes amazing amps, that's what I've got downstairs, I didn't feel like bringing them up because I need them downstairs set up the way they are, so I just grabbed a, a deluxe. Just, I grabbed the closest thing to me and brought it upstairs, put the ox on top. And it didn't take long before I got, this is the sound that of the amp that I really want. I don't need, I, it's, it's odd, it's the first time. I don't, I'm not having any pedals plugged in in front of it. It's different than an overdrive pedal. I mean, I've got pretty common those things that are clear and you can see through tubs. I've got tubs, you know, this big, filled with pedals. Nothing seems to help, is what I say. I still take out pedals, but you know. And I've got some great pedals, King of Tone and all these things that I like at the front end, but I don't feel that I need it for writing. I can get the sound, and I can get the sound quietly in the room. And I love sitting next to my amp. And you know, oh, I'll turn this, I'll turn that, or I'll turn something on the aux. It's actually changed and, uh, and made me much happier in the recording world. Yeah. I think it's interest, interesting to note that you were talking about mic placement was an important thing for you to sort of suss out. It's not just in front of the. But I do have a mic on the on the amps on the amp too. Oh, okay. So I he's have using a, it for an attenuator. Yeah, I, oh, use, I use it as a load box, and the sound coming out of the amp okay. is is incredible. And then I'll supplement that with a line out with uh, you know some of that whatever that is if I need it, but half the time I don't even need it. Just the reverb and the tremolo and the amp sounds for what I'm doing perfect. It sounds great. Yeah. Sure, well I was gonna say, to, to expand on that, 
in the recording world, like as far as like you know, getting in the computer or whatever and using it for what it, for what it it can shine. Also, is <clears throat> I was looking for a uh, for a load box basically, and I remember I ran into you at Yam, yeah. and you were over at the UA booth and you were demoing this thing, and I was like, that's cool. I, I actually was looking for a good attenuator for my louder amps. You know that you basically, in, in a nutshell, if you if you aren't a guitar player, or you don't know, but you know you basically your speaker cable out goes into this box and then it goes to your speaker cabinet after that. And then you can like turn the level, you can crank your amp all the way up and get all the like harmonics and distortion and awesomeness out of the amp that you couldn't get in a bedroom level or even on a lot of stages that you're playing. And then attenuate it and and, uh, and get it down to a whisper but it still sounds like it's, it sounds cranked and it sounds right. amazing. And this is the one that I thought sounded better than most of the load boxes out there. because. Uh, you know, the technology has come so far, but when when I got to see what it really did through one of your videos online, of um, it basically has an interface you can use on an iPad or your computer. I use the one on my computer, and it pulls up all these different cabinets that they have. That's what you were saying. Well, it's, it's, I know you were probably getting ready to get into that, so I hope I'm not hijacking your store. But, um, you know, it has all these different cabinets and high-end microphones that you can select uh, to change out. Uh, and the phasing is perfect, and you can add room mic in, you can take it out, you can pan it, it, it has uh, effects that are great, and, um, and it, it kind of changed a lot for me because I was always a purist with, with high-end microphones all on my like really nice cabinets with very particular speakers in them and all in like uh, isolated cabinets in my studio so that the, so that we could crank the amps without it blowing away everybody else if we had to cut live. And um, I haven't, I mean, to be to be honest, after I plugged it in and listened to it and A-B'd it back and forth, uh, you know, there was not a bit of skepticism at all. I haven't turned on those microphones <coughs> since I got it. Wow. And I mean, I'm not sitting here just trying to be a salesman sure, for it. Sure. It just really is, it's that dope, it's good, <coughs> yeah. Can I go, please? please? Yeah, that's that's a pretty amazing testament. All three of these guys have rooms at home that they built. I have a vault in my garage that should be bigger. It's not the greatest environment, but I'm still attached to my real guitar sounds. This is an amazing tool in my toolbox because anytime you record direct, and you are recording direct through this when you use it, correct? Yeah. The sound gets right in your face. Mm -hmm. And I can't quite do that with my real sounds, as much as I love my real sounds, and I still do. The other thing about this, it's such a pleasure. There's not too much information on the iPad. There's a short list, and another short list, and another short list. Okay, okay, there's the Marshall, there's the 57, there's the 120, I'll use the M160. When you go to the room sounds, and you turn on the room sound in the aux, I literally get chills. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's real. What am I at the record plant now? It's like, oh, this is amazing. <laughs> so there's an excitement in the thing. That space yeah. that Buddy was talking yeah, about. Yeah, and I can't get that at home. You can. You probably can. You can. I don't have that at home. I have a vault. It's um, it's not a great environment. My my recording environment is. Well, the, the cool thing about what you're saying is, the, our, the classic guitar tones that we've all talked about were rec made with microphones. They weren't in room sound. They weren't made with room pedals. Sound, we've we've here. developed. Yeah pedals to kind of get us there because we can't always be in a studio or have this you know luxury and that sort of thing and it's it's cool that we can actually say oh well, just with a microphone sound we can get the tones or get the ballpark of what we really like which is pretty amazing that it does that yeah and there for me there are three devices that you can use it's either the fractal or the Kemper or this and the, the thing about this is you're using your own amp mm -hmm. and it's just fun it's, and simple and the, also the practical nature of you you without it. So you're just miking up your amp, you're getting a sound, and you're playing it against the track, and it's okay. This is this is going to work. But what's great about this is you 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 get your sound, and you're playing the track like press a button. Okay, now I have a different cabinet. Now I press another button. Now I have a different mic. So you really fine tune your sound. You know, it's like having guys moving your 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 speakers and your mics and your mic piece, you know, on the spot. In the, in the, you just can't have, you can't do that. So the, the amount of the, the extra creative ability to to get sounds and, and, and even enhance the music is is instant. That's yeah. what I love about it. Yeah. I was you know I had a guy bring me a solo rap. He said I want you to listen to. It. I go I don't need it. I've got amps. I've got great cabinets. And if 
like I was telling you, within 10 minutes or 15 minutes of him plugging in, I, I was like, I gotta have this. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't need it, I didn't want it. Yeah, same, same so, with me. So, yeah. He used to plug it in and out. Yeah. This has changed things so you can get that sound and you can get it quiet if you want to through your amp, or you can just go direct out of it. Yeah. It's amazing. It's a, it's a pretty funny thing how law of attraction works too. So my, my story real quickly was that I needed to transition into my uh, recording, my recording world needed a transition gear wise. Um, and I do a lot of online instruction too where having a direct uh, option in an apartment is really great to get great guitar sound. And um, I needed to transition from a piece of gear that was kind of on the way out in my opinion. But I didn't want to get back into another box that had menu buttons on it. And I wanted to get back to using my amp because I remember what it was like when I had my first amp for a long time. And you knew every bit of that dial. And I, I was working with an artist uh, a couple months ago and I said, hey, go over there and turn my Princeton from three to three and a half. And he went, really? And I was like, oh no, it's, you're gonna hear a difference. And, and so what my point is, is that when you pick a piece of gear, you know, this stuff is, it, it's available, the prices are in, within a lot of our reach, but it's still, you know, it, it's a lot of money to buy a hand, a hand wound tube, a hand made tube amp or any, any kind of a piece of gear like that. And you want to get a relationship with it. And when you, when you have to sacrifice that relationship to go do, use a piece of gear or something that's, that's not yours that you've been using on the gig or, or whatever, it's, it, for me, the, the magic's gone. I wanted to use my gear. So I was using some, some gear that got me into the ballpark of what this piece is. And uh, I approached uh, Universal Audio and I said, I can tell the story about this if you let me. And when I put my presentation together, I said, I'm not gonna be a shredder at this booth. I said, this is no BS. I said, I'm gonna do something like Butch Walker would play. <laughs> and I'm serious, I'll go. <laughs> Probably a song of his. Was it clear that everyone knows that that's what they're hearing right now? Right? They, There's no mics on these amps. No, that's right. So, so, so all the, the box, that's all right. All the great guitar, guitar sounds you've been hearing have not been coming through microphones. There's no mics on these cabinets. The speakers, they're, not on. They're, the speakers aren't even on. Yeah. <laughs> so. It, it, really, it really shines as well. I, I know I keep coming back to being the token like rock representation here, but like it shines with like high gain amps too. Really does. Like my, yeah. I got an old Boogie Mark III head that just Ooh. sounds amazing, and and I play it through that and put it through one of the 412 cabinets built into it. Yeah, it's amazing. It sounds great. Yeah. So I mean, and, I, and it sounds as good or better than if I mic it. Wow. Yeah. So I mean, you know, it, it covers all. Uh, breathability yeah. of amps, you know? Yeah, and the thing is, is, is you went the opposite way and said it sounds good with high gain amps, and usually, so we're already validating it sounds good with clean amps. I mean, listen to Buddy's tone, it's as mm -hmm. organic as, as you can get. I mean, it's, it's really delivering. Um, so we don't often get a chance to have these types of folks doing what they do on a stage in one captive environment. So um, we talked about maybe a few questions but only a few because we're running out of time. So somebody was walking around with a microphone, I think. Um, okay, you can stand up, we can hear you. All right, so somebody fire a question away now. Go ahead. Yeah, so you're just lining out? Everybody's lined out into the board then? That's right, yeah. Okay. No speaker, I mean, I was blown away. I came up here, where's the amp? Oh, it's yeah. not on, oh, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Can you expand on the comparison of this to a fractal? Not in this setting. Okay. Yeah, uh, but there's plenty of there's plenty of videos and things available because that would probably take the rest of our time. But all you need to know is that you're hearing these amplifiers, the tone from the amplifiers coming through aux, and it's being uh, routed through the front of house system. We don't even need speakers. We don't even need these speakers. I didn't even need to ship that. That's purely cosmetic. <laughs> Go ahead in the back. Um, I was just. I haven't yet. Yeah, but it, I, I mean, it's, I would. it's live that I'm in a room I'm with some like players that, writing. That's just buzz. It was mind blowing to me when you said that nothing was mine. Right. That sounds like legit. Like yeah, I used it with um, an artist. Uh, uh, I did a fill-in gig for um, a really great Nashville artist, Cassidy Pope. I filled in for her, and uh, I knew it was going to be 
all in your rig, tracks, the whole nine yards. I mean, when you're doing these kinds of gigs, it's like you have a lot of stuff going in your head. Somebody's going, and chorus, two, three, four. <laughs> Guitar solo, two, three, four. What's my name? Yeah. <laughs> it's, I mean, because if you're on a catwalk, you know, you need to know when the bridge is coming up to, to get back to your microphone so you can sing. Um, but I did use it for that, and it was it was great. And you could, um, you, you have the ability to bring in some room sound, some that we were talking about. And it, if you've ever listened to a microphone, like Buddy was saying, on a speaker directly into your ears, it is not the way we perceive guitar tone. It's just, right. um, and this really helps us get closer. Yeah. Can you talk like about the volume on your guitar itself? Because I know that makes a difference than just the amp. As far as, you know, dialing in. I'll, I'll start this and then give it to these guys. I recently found out that with them, um, I started to treat my guitar like it's the microphone going into a, a preamp on a console and, and how it drives the front end of your amp and how you have so much, like Tim was saying, flexibility with your guitar volume. And you can do so much just by tweaking the knobs on your guitar and then getting the relationship with the amp. I think so, that's also amp dependent because a right. lot of amps sure. are just dynamic. That's right, that's right. Rich. So a lot of times, like a, like, like if I use my boogie, it's like full on. Right? Yeah. And yeah. like, and if I use like my, you know, my, my three monkeys or my basement or anything like that, then it's very dynamic and you use your volume and you can get super sparkling clean by just rolling down. Like the Princeton will do that, you know? Right. And, and with no pedal on and you can turn it up and still get it, still get it to break up, you know? by hitting it harder. And I think that's probably not so much uh, this box as what you put into it amp-wise. Right. Yeah. I think we all like amps that oh, yeah. have yeah. bloom to them, where the harder you hit it, the more it opens and the more it distorts, unless it's a special purpose and you really want it to be. A high gain amp is really only gonna do one thing. Yeah. But we all like amps that can kind of open and close. Yes. Uh, I was just going to say that this, the, the box is just what you put into it is what you get. So right. it's really no difference than, yeah. you know, it, what the speaker does is just giving you some other options, yeah. and many options. Yeah, absolutely. <coughs> One more in the back. Maybe so, you. Uh, not maybe an obvious question, but it, it'll do the attenuation thing and the direct out thing at the same time. Yes, yeah. yeah. The direct out signal does not come through your speakers, however, and that's as technical as we're going to get on that. Right. <laughs> right, but, but like, let's say you're sending it direct to a PA. You, you can still have stage volume. Yeah. You have overdrive and direct out the the attenuator doesn't affect what level out goes to the board because there's a separate output for that. Yeah. There's a separate volume called direct out on. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, no. That one guy right there. Go ahead. Sorry, folks. Cool. Uh, all like the menu options, the software stuff, and go like go to an iPad or your laptop. That's right. Yeah. Where you can try all your stuff. Yeah, you can you can save a bunch of crazy. You can, crazy or you can you have that like live on stage. Yeah, we'll see. This, this has. Sure. I'm sorry, I keep talking and interrupting you. Dude, you're good. Uh, go for it. Uh, but there's six preset selections on here. You can save tons of them on the app, but you can assign six of them to this rotary switch. And even and you don't have to have a laptop hooked up to it or anything. If you take it out live, it remembers it inside the box. That's what, that's what it's gonna do. Yeah. It saves your options. Like yeah. So you one tweak. Yeah, and one setting can have like tons of flooded reverb and edge delay and chorus on it, and one can just be a dry 112 cabinet like a Fender Champ, and then sure. you know another one can be a 412. So it's you can get drastic different sounds just by using it live without a laptop. So it's, it's very intuitive, yeah. and there's, there's not too much stuff to right. Do. It's just the right amount. Yeah. That's the thing, you know, within the 10 minutes of, the, of the, the demo I got. It's like, okay, there it is. There's your mics, you switch your mics, you switch your cabinets, there's an EQ, right. and then some of these great, you know, kind of basic effects that you'd want on your guitar sound. Right? Yeah, that, out of all the options that I mentioned, it's the most user-friendly. I mean, yeah. I was, I was, it was instant. Sure, yeah. And that's the thing, I think, at the, the essence of what we're talking about here is how to great, get great guitar tone. And in, in getting great guitar tone is our personality. And to have a bunch of things in the way of the finish line is, is not what we want to have. And to have a, um, a product that we can set and forget very quickly and get to the finish line and be creative, whether it's just writing a song in our room or cranking up our 100 watt plexi to a level that's that's uh, listenable. Any Anything you can imagine about what you long for with your relationship with your gear uh, is achievable with this and you don't, you don't have to really dive deep. 
So we got a few minutes, uh, and uh, I, I, I mentioned this to Butch. They're gonna want to hear us play. Yes. So Butch, I saw you do this thing at the Ryman last year. You did a little tribute to Bob Dylan. It was, it was actually no. It was just, uh, it was a Tom, it was a Tom Jones. It was a Tom Jones tribute. Yeah. <laughs> no, but you played uh, uh, this Bob Dylan tribute, and uh, I, I thought you did a killer job and brought all your normal Butch Walker esque energy to it. So, um, if you would, would uh, mind kicking off a little. <laughs> Take them out this door over here and you can talk to them outside. So thank y'all for coming.